attendance so far. So um, welcome, everybody. Um, I guess this is the first first edition of the Montana Cadastral Technical Working Group. So appreciate your time, and hopefully we have some good contributions over the over the next few meetings. Um, just um, I thought I, I figured we'd just start meeting quarterly. Um, I think that's just fine. Um, and we can make it as long as as long as we have something to talk about. So I did schedule it for 90 minutes, um, but I think that should be fine. So, and just a reminder, this uh, meeting is being recorded uh, just more for purposes of people that can't make it um, and obviously to make it easier to take notes and, and review things um, for those that wanna um, to do that. So um, I will make those available, um, both meeting notes and the recording on the, the MSDI cadastral page off the, the state's website. Um, and I guess with, with with that, we'll just go into um, introductions, just because there's so many of you guys on the call. And, um, I would like for everyone to just state their organization or affiliation, um, their outlook on this uh, technical working group. Um, and their current role or uses of the cadastral data. Um, so I guess I'll just start from the top, um, Montana uh, Land Re uh, Reliance. I believe that's Matt, right? Is that Matt Bell? That's right, okay. that's right. Good morning, Jeff, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Bell, I work for Montana Land Reliance and we use cadastral on a daily basis, if not hourly basis. Um, we roll web services into our organizational uh, mapping software for everybody here. And um, we use it to uh, determine property boundaries and kind of get the ball rolling on projects. So um, we do use it intensively. And um, I hope to, to um, what I hope to gain from this is um, uh, just a better understanding of, of how the cadastral frameworks works in general um, and, um, you know, an opportunity to provide any kind of feedback. You know, we commonly encounter errors and things like that. And, and uh, so just a, a maybe a clarification on where and how to report those errors um, would be, be great, but that's all I got. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Aaron Vaughn. Hi. Yeah, this is Aaron Vaughn uh, out of the city of Great Falls coordinator. Um, yeah, I just like to learn a little bit more about how everybody else uses cadastral and how it may change in the future. And uh, currently looking to um, update some of our local um, uh, cadastral survey points uh, through, a, through a grant to the library. So got a few things going there. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Um, Allison Kennedy. Hi, I'm Allison Kennedy. I am um, a GIS analyst for the Department of Revenue, and I edit and maintain the cadastral data for Gallatin, Madison, Marr, Park, and Beaverhead counties. Um, and I'm actually hoping, you know, I know where a lot of the errors are and I've found all kinds of cool resources and things like that to make the PLSS better. And I'm hoping to like find a way to like get this up and in, into the statewide databases a lot faster than our current processes, you know, cause I just stumble on things and I really easily can like kind of draw out sections and be like, hey, look, all of a sudden this fits. And, you know, it'd have to wait for the whole PLSS and for somebody to come out and survey and to get all of those points in is kind of slow. Mm -hmm. yep. That's my that's my goal is to kind of find a way that we can collaborate and get all of our data together and sort of maybe if we can speed up the process. Yeah, and just so everyone is aware too, uh, Allison also kind of does represent all of the analysts from DOR, because um, I did did kind of want to have um, one of the county analysts um, on this call. So she does kind of represent um, the state in that capacity. So, uh, Alan Armstrong. 
Yeah, hey, good morning, everybody. Alan Armstrong here with the Bureau of Land Management, uh, Montana State Office in Billings. I'm the GIS program coordinator for Montana and the Dakotas. Uh, I am not in the cadastral branch, which is another branch that I work with to try and coordinate, hopefully, the partnership in developing better control and, and better input into what Montana houses as the, the default database for uh, PLSS and the outcomes from that uh, parcel fabric and so on. So uh, partnership with, uh, with you guys a lot and, and looking forward to enhancing more of the public land data that we have out there. We use it extensively for surface ownership and subsurface mineral estate as well as oil and gas leases and everything else. So we're very dependent on that. And uh, I'm also al always trying to inform the cadastral branch of how important our role is in this in, in making sure that we actually have a, a contributing partnership with uh, Montana and the Dakotas as well. So hopefully uh, we'll uh, be uh, integrating those folks a little bit more as we move into ARC Pro parcel fabric and, and getting that input data from, uh, from the survey cadastral community back into the fabric uh, that was left off long ago. So thanks for setting this up, Jeff. And, and uh, I, I agree, you've got a great uh, group of participants in this uh, first quarterly meeting. Yeah, yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, Alan. I, I, I was quite surprised too. So I, and, um, I think for everybody's time too, so. Uh, Andy, Andy Rolf. Andy, I think you might be muted. I'm not sure if you have a mic or not. Uh, we'll circle, we'll circle back to you. Are you there, Andy? Okay, we'll, we'll circle back to him. Uh, Bob Holiday. Sorry, I was stumbling with unmute. Um, I'm Bob Holiday. I'm a GIS analyst at the Montana State Library. I am, I'm not really a user of cadastral per se, nor the public land survey. I'm kind of, uh, I guess troubleshooter for lack of a better lack of a better term. I I I I pride myself on finding problems <laughs> and not always having a solution. Anyway, I'm here to kind of just watch what's going on, see what's on the horizon because I end up being involved behind the scenes and in, in, a, in a lot of getting the data out the, when, when it comes time to get the data out the door here. That that's kind of my role. And also I'm manage I'm not manager, I'm theme lead for geodetic control. So the survey data that we con that we um, get from grants comes to me and I get it formatted um, in GIS format, projected if necessary, and passed off to Jeff for loading into the fabric. That's it, Jeff. All right, appreciate it, thanks, Bob. Uh, let's go with Brandy Holstein. Hi, everyone. Thanks for putting this together, Jeff. Um, I work for Department of Revenue, um, like Allison, and um, I used to be a uh, county analyst, like Allison was doing, but I work at um, in the central office now. So we are um, very interested in looking at ways to um, increase the, the standardization and uh, QA, QC, things that we all can do to make it um, use the word again, to make everything more standard statewide. Um, we don't keep all the county's data. We do, we maintain all the parcels except for five counties, which I think there's someone from each of the five counties on here, which is great. Cause I think we, it's just, we just need to have everybody all in the same room to, uh, to work on this. Appreciate it. Thanks, Brandy. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan Staley. Hi everyone, Dan Staley here from Marls. I sit on the um, the Miliac Council 
um, as a Marl's representative. I'm a private land surveyor for Staley Engineering and Associates. Uh, we've been using the cadastral basically since it got released uh, for mainly for preliminary uh, land title boundary research and mapping. I'd say that's oh, 80% of what we use it for. And the other 20 is for uh, GIS research type projects, uh, mapping, but not necessarily uh, survey grade mapping. Um, from, from Marl's perspective, uh, I will say that the, my interest in this technical working group is just figuring out how professional land surveyors can continue to help um, with the cadastral project. It's such a uh, a, a successful project and, and just something that's, that's I, I believe, known nationwide. It's very respected and, and um, would like to help continue to uh, improve it. One thing that's kind of a double-edged sword for private surveyors, though, because it also um, has, been, has been mentioned several times here, it's also incredibly incorrect uh, in massive areas in the state, which gives uh, a surveyor is a lot of work. So, so, but no, uh, uh, the goal is to just figure out how to get survey control data to the state very efficiently and uh, any way surveyors can help. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. Um, Andy Raw, I think we can circle back to you. I think you messaged me. So, let's see if your mic's working now. Okay, I guess not. <laughs> Technology. Apologize, everyone. Uh, Aaron Fashway. Good morning, everyone. Hi, my name is Aaron Fashway. I'm the state GIS coordinator. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think that uh, very excited about the uh, reinvigoration of the cadastral um, <clears throat> framework working group. And um, um, technically, we'd like to see all MSDI themes um, reconvene uh, their working groups. Um, in, in recent history, we've seen the, uh, six, a lot of successes come out of the elevation working group and then the recent land cover working group, um, and they've developed pretty in-depth, um, well-written plans for the future of the theme. So I think that that's something else um, that I probably see uh, in the future for this group. So I'm very excited to have everyone on. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I use the cadastral um, in many different ways, personally and professionally, but mostly I'm out there um, um, promoting the cadastral along with the with the rest of the MSDI. Uh, we always kind of call the cadastral our bread and butter. I did used to work on updates when I was an analyst uh, over seven years ago. So pretty familiar with the update process or the old update process for that matter and worked a lot with the uh, county um, <clears throat> DOR cartographers. And so also I serve as the state of Montana or as a representative on the FGDC cadastral uh, working group. And so one of the things that's being talked about nationally is a, is, a, is a nationwide parcel service. And I'd like to thank Dan for your compliments on the data. It, we are very well known. We've had a cadastral in place for over um, 15 years now, statewide cadastral. We have updates monthly, um, which you don't see in other states. So still, um, we still are able to, um, to do those monthly updates and I'm pretty excited about um, the prospects of this group. So thanks everyone for being here. We appreciate it. Perfect, thanks Aaron. Uh, Gina with DNRC. Hi everyone, I'm Gina Maza. I work for the DNRC and um, well, more specifically for trust lands within the DNRC. And I'm responsible for our surface tracks, our, actually our surface and our subsurface. So any mineral ownership and leases. 
Um, and I'm here, I'm interested because we have some, some workflows that are, that exist, but they're not really the best. <laughs> and so I'm excited to be part of this group to see if there are ways of improving our workflows and integrating better with each other, um, are all these different agencies that are here to um, improve the data, improve the cadastral. Terrific, thanks, Gina. Uh, Jeremy with Butte Silver Bow. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, my name is Jeremy Grappo, and I am the GIS coordinator here at Butte Silver Bow. Uh, my department, specifically myself, am charged with uh, updating our land record um, uh, files here in the form of um, any of our tax parcels um, in GIS. Uh, we're one of the counties that does do that specifically and then share those results with um, the state of Montana. Uh, we do also have a land records department, the land records administrator, um, though I take care of the GIS work um, from their standpoint, any of the, the line splits and combinations. Uh, much of our records are based on um, mine claim, um, historic mine claims um, and property descriptions related to those mine claims. Um, so it's a little bit different. Um, we also do have a county assessor um, who we collaborate with, uh, at least for the time being. So there's a couple different moving pieces. Um, basically, uh, my hope is to uh, determine what other counties um, are doing around me, um, as well as see what some of those uh, quasi-independent counties um, do as well um, for taking care of their land records. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, Ken Miller with Ravalli. I think Ken doesn't have a mic, but he's here. So <laughs> appreciate it. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Matt Trevish. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, Matt Trevish. I'm uh, with the Montana State Library. I'm a GIS analyst, and I'm uh, newly there as of last October. Um, just here to absorb some of this uh, working group's um, information. I come from a background of local government, and I'm, I'm just putting it all together and want to hear, hear what you folks are working on here and get an idea of how we can help uh, our mission at the library. Appreciate it. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Megan Burns. Hello. Uh, Megan Burns, also with the Montana State Library. I'm the administrative boundary coordinator, and a lot of the boundary data sets align with the either the CAD and the CI or the parcels. So very involved. <laughs> Thanks, Chef. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Michael Fashway. Hi everyone, Michael Fashway, Montana State Library. I'm the land information lead, so I work with Megan and Jeff and Bob and Matt and everyone else here and just try to keep the whole team going in the right direction. Perfect. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Mike Powell, Yellowstone County. Uh, hello, uh, this is Mike Powell. Uh, yeah, I'm the GIS manager for Yellowstone County. We are one of the counties that uh, uh, that does our own parcels and feeds it to the, the state on a daily basis. Um, I'm just here to help everybody and try to get some ideas on, you know, if we're going to make this a new, a better workflow. Um, I certainly want to be involved in that in any way we can. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Mike Schnuck. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Mike Schnuck. I am the uh, GIS manager for Missoula County. Um, <clears throat> we are also another one of the, uh, I think the five or the seven counties that maintain our own cadastral data set uh, that we provide to the state. Um, I'm here to kind of get some ideas and see what everybody else is working on. Um, and it's good to be here. So thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. Um, Nate uh, with US Forest Service. I don't know if Nate and Will, you want to go together since you kind of work together. Um, I can go first, but Will will probably add more later. Um, but anyway, hi, I'm Nathan Teets. Work with uh, Northern or Region 1 out of Missoula for the Forest Service. Um, we try to align all of our data to the CAD and SDI, you know, um, parcels and stuff like that. And I also coordinate um, inputting some of the survey points that we do for the Forest Service back into the back to the state so they can work that into future adjustments. 
um, yeah, thanks for having us. And, and yeah. Will, do you, Will, do you want to add to that? You bet. Yeah. Hi, I'm I'm Will Petty. I'm the <clears throat> land status program manager for the Forest Service in Region One, which is all of Montana and Northern Idaho and some of the Dakotas. Um, yeah, like Nathan said, we maintain a cadastral database, real similar to Montana Cadastral, um, but for the Forest Service lands. And we rely heavily on Montana Cadastral to help verify our property boundaries. And we also roll the parcels from Montana Cadastral into some of our web products to show non-federal ownership, essentially. Um, and then we also, <clears throat> like Nathan said, are aligning our data to the latest versions of the CAD and SDI. That's a slow, painstaking process, but we're working on it. And so that's a really important product for us. And then we're also trying to uh, provide survey control back to the state to incorporate into the CAD and SDI for all the points that our, our land surveyors are out collecting during the year. Um, so that's that's kind of the PLSS side. And then on the parcel side, too, we're also interested in, you know, when we find discrepancies between our data and the state's data and how we get those fixed up. Um, so, yeah, thanks for having us. Glad to be here. Yeah, I appreciate your contributions uh, to Cashel uh, thus far there, Will. Good, yeah, Jeff. Uh, Wally Gladstone. Jeff, sure appreciate the, the invite to be a part of this. Yeah, this team. I'm surprised at the number of names I recognize as, as we go <laughs> through the list. Um, I'm, I'm a professional land surveyor. I work for Northern Engineering and Consulting Incorporated, NECI. Um, I'm also the technical advisor for, for survey issues with the Rocky Mountain Tribal Leaders Council. I, my, my interest is the cadastral on the reservations. The, the piece I'd I'm, I'm real interested here as this thing goes through is, is maybe doing a pilot project where where surveys done on reservations they can be you know potentially submitted via a flash drive or or coordinates put on the on the plats and I think that would help expedite our expedite our cadastral layer there not necessarily calling it a survey grade layer because that's that's not, that wouldn't be correct because surveyors would definitely still have to go out there and do the work, but it would tighten things up pretty quick. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, yep. Thanks, Wally. Uh, Warren Rowe. Hi, everyone. Warren Rowe with uh, Gallatin County GIS. I'm the GIS supervisor here. Um, we use the cadastral data. Um, Maybe not directly, for example, using uh, web map services, um, but we do definitely pass in requests from our web map. Um, so somebody clicks on a parcel, they can look up the cadastral record. Um, I know that functionality is, is currently down. I'm not quite sure how that works, um, but some sort of API, I, be I believe, on the cadastral data that then, you know, click on a lot, see... Uh, see the cadastral records that are associated with it. So Gallatin County does maintain its own parcel records. Um, and on, uh, I'll, I'll take a risk here and, and, and I'm not gonna speak for the city of Bozeman. Um, and I'm, I don't see them on the call here, but um, they also maintain some of their own um, parcel records that I, I believe are pretty high accuracy. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, I don't have a background in parcels and cadastral data, but um, I'm very interested to learn more. I know they're important, certainly for land records. Um, I'd like to put a little bit of a different spin on these things and say they're also important for emergency response. Um, if you think about legal descriptions of a fire district or something like that, they're certainly oftentimes built off of parcels and then that rolls up into sort of a, a response boundary. So um, they can be very important and this seem is very foundational. And, uh, for a lot of what we do. And um, echoing just one or two of the comments I heard before, I think it's a really incredible resource for Montana, uh, lived in other states and you don't see something like this. Uh, so it's, it's I, I'm just really impressed that this, uh, this exists and it's, it's got little problems, but generally it's, um, it's a heck of a resource. So thanks for the invitation and uh, look to, look to meeting, meeting you guys in person someday. Yeah, appreciate. It. Thanks, Warren. Um, I think we do have a, a representation from Flathead County. Is that correct? 
I'm, I'm not familiar, familiar with some of these names at the bottom here, so. Uh, yeah, that's that's correct. Um, I'm a I'm Chris Cresilius, uh from Flathead County GIS. Um, uh, recently got hired on as a survey specialist with this office, and um, we are working uh, here in the county with um, uh, our award with the ML MLIA grant and uh, starting that process of uh, updating our mapping control and how that's tying in with the cadastral network. Um, is really an interesting process and hearing what other counties are up to and the state in general um, as far as ideas and collaboration is really um, the main interest in uh, participating in this group. Um, it sounds like uh, everyone has got a really good attitude towards this work and, and I think uh, there's some, some amazing information that's going to come out of this. So thank you very much for having us. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Uh, did I miss anyone? I think I've missed a couple. I think there's a one phone phone number on here I don't recognize too. Um, this is Brian Shaw with the NOAA's National Geodetic Survey. I came on a little late. Um, I was just calling in because I thought it'd be an interesting working group to be involved with uh, since we're geodetic control. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, Brian. Okay, I think that's it. Um, so I'll just kind of go over kind of some brief goals and kind of just hearing from, from you all. Um, I think we can easily expand upon this to, you know, to improve improve workflows and, and like Brandy was saying, you know, create standardizations um, or, or, or attempt to create standardizations, I should say. Um, but I, th I think it would be nice to um, contribute and, and review um, a cadastral assessment plan. Um, I don't think there's currently one. Some of the other themes here at the State Library do have their own um, their own plans and kind of like what Aaron was saying, it's kind of just a nice um, overlook of where we want to um, go with this, with, with the cadastral theme, so. Um, I would say the second one is collectively make recommendations for improvements uh, to be made to the cadastral data. Um, third one is uh, is contribute and uh, redesign uh, methodology to be used to establish um, improved um, priority control collection areas. And I will go into kind of the, the current method that, that we use for that. But um, it, is, it is a challenge here at the State Library to um, identify um, those, those areas those priority areas for control. Um, so I will go into that later though. Um, the state's purpose uh, for creating an assessment plan that I kind of just quickly um, came off the top of my head this morning uh, was to, um, to assess the completeness of the owner parcels, public lands, conservation easements, and as well as the PLSS. Um, identify areas uh, that need improvements, um, redesign criteria used to identify priority control collection areas to enhance the PLSS um, and, and outline recommendations from stakeholder input on ways to improve cadastral data. So pretty similar to the, to the goals, um, um, but just kind of want to outline my purposes. And I, and I think there probably is um, other, other purposes for this assessment plan. So um, I'm welcome to go into discussion from, from folks. Um, contributors and users of cadastral data. Um, and, and some of it was highlighted um, in, in the introductions, um, but yeah, this is kind of just a open discussion for whoever wants to, whoever wants to speak.
guess I'll say something. This is Michael Fashway, State Library again. One of the things we've struggled with over the years is, um, and Jeff has hit on this a couple times, is kind of coming up with a, a good way to prioritize, well, to determine statewide where adjustments need to occur. I mean, I think we can all look at our favorite areas and see where there's issues, but from a statewide approach, coming up with a methodology to, you know, assess the entire state in a somewhat standardized fashion doesn't really exist. Um, at the same time, we have our grant program, which for as long as I can remember has prioritized uh, collecting survey control for PLSS and cadastral adjustments. Um, and over the years, we've, I think we've had, you know, pretty good success at getting overall uh, local governments to, to apply for, for grants um, to do that work. But there has been times where we certainly aren't seeing as, as much interest in doing that. And so we've been working at ways to, to tweak that grant program and hopefully make it easier for uh, local governments and such to, to apply. Um, and as part of that, you know, we were hoping to come up with a methodology to, you know, have basically a map that says, you know, these are known priority areas and both it would allow us to do a little bit more outreach to specific uh, local governments and stuff where those priority areas were. And the flip side is it would allow one of those local governments if they happen to be in a priority area to see that and hopefully apply for the grant, possibly in a more streamlined fashion. Um, but again, coming up with that standardized methodology to do some level of assessments kind of tricky because um, over the years, uh, there's been enough adjustment work and everything and there hasn't been any sort of uh, way to kind of definitively, um, there, there's a lot of issues that go into uh, how accurate a given area is and without kind of looking at it and looking at all the base data and getting input, for example, from Department of Revenue and potentially even surveyors to know what exactly the issue is there. Um, you know, it can sometimes be difficult to tell what the best solution is, whether we need new survey control or whether an area might just need to be uh, reviewed from, um, you know, like a, a parcel cogoing, you know, parcel drafting perspective. Um, so, cause we've seen, we've seen it go both ways. Um, so with that, uh, I don't know if that helps I got folks it. think about. Go yeah. ahead. Thanks, thanks, Michael, right. for being the first one, so. All right, I'm gonna jump in because I come across this like all, like all the time in my daily work, you know, like different places where there's say maybe two section corners, but I'm digging up, I can dig up all the old surveys and be like, you know, and kind of say, oh, this person started here and this person started there. But I also use like all kinds of like the MDT control points from their surveys and can like draw out and build sections and really get the control a lot better, especially the internal breakdowns, like the 16th corners that nobody tends to pick up that can be, that sometimes are important and aren't on a straight line or halfway between point A and point B, you know, the way they're supposed to. And I mean, I can, like, it's 
almost frustrating because I'm like, I can draw this, I can make this all better, but I have no way to like push it up and say, this is, you know, this is close. This is, this should be the accurate section corner. This is the corner everybody surveyed off of, you know, I like have all of this stuff and just know where to, know where to get it up and to people and, you know, making sense. You know, I've got one built right here. If I could share my, I don't know if I, I don't think I can share my screen, but of in Bozeman of sections that are just off and we have all this MDT control points and I can draw them and make them look really nice and make all, the, and then all the parcels line up nicely to these actual points. Um, but this, you know, until my, my quick and dirty work or something gets put into the PLSS, I'm hesitant to make any changes on the parcels because they will get adjusted once, when and if these lines ever, you know, the PLSS lines and points ever get adjusted. Yeah, you make some good points there, Allison, um, and, and make, maybe Michael or Megan can chime in, but I know we did a pilot project um, incorporating adjustments from Guy up there in the, the north central part. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think it was around Tool County, Tool and maybe parts of Liberty County um, in Pend um, Yeah. Yeah, I'm just taking the MDT highway surveys and putting their coordinates into a table and then just mapping the table. And it's, I will say my, what I'm doing is quick and dirty and we are not at DOR um, currently using um, the NAD 2011 projection. So the projections are gonna be slightly off, but like in places where stuff is, you know, right here in Bozeman, I'm just looking at 30 to 40 feet off, you know, but mm -hmm. there are other areas that it's significantly off. like. It's like, wow, well, what I've got is significantly better than what's already there. Mm -hmm. And if so, I just had a place to send it and somebody could like run their magic and, you know, make sure that everything goes where it's supposed to in the right coordinate system and using the right transformations. I'd be, I'd be so happy. <laughs> so I, I'd like to chime in here. We, um, we have adjusted Gallatin in the past prior mm -hmm. to, and, and in fact, it was a several year project back in the early teens. At that point in time, we were not using MDT data. We, we just couldn't get our hands on it. Um, I the, mean, I hand type in these, uh, the coordinate tables uh, from the file surveys. So what I'm trying to get to is we haven't been in Gallatin County since we've started taking yeah. in the MDT data. We get MDT data as we move into a county to do adjustments. We just haven't moved into Gallatin County and done any adjustments since we started grabbing MDT yep. data. And usually, what usually what's driving us to to go ask for the MDT stuff is as a follow up to a to an MLIA grant that's been awarded. We go in there and get the MDT stuff to make sure that to to just to try to keep things from being double collected. Yeah. And I'm, I mean, I could run across this issue and I don't know what other counties you're using it for because um, it doesn't come up. Most of my counties were adjusted last year and a lot of them don't, haven't used surveys or it doesn't appear like they're using the surveys. So maybe it's just where I'm at, but. Yeah, um, we used a lot of the MDT control for the Madison County um, MLA, MLA stuff. Um, yeah. And so that, so we, we did use, you know, a combination of both what was collected in the grant and then what we got from, from MDT. And so kind of like what Bob was saying, that's kind of what prompts us to, to go after um, some of that MDT stuff is kind of we're in that area. It's a priority area for us, um, mostly because of the MLA, MLA grant program. So, yeah. So what I'm hearing from you guys is it sounds like in order to, to uh, I'm not quite using the correct f phrasing here, but it, to improve your baseline data, essentially, you really, you really want the involvement of folks such as me applying for grants. Essentially, a lot of the activity is grant driven. Is that, is, am I hearing that right? Currently, that's correct, I, I think. Sorry, I spoke out of turn. Yeah. 
I, the I'm original, gonna... the original, sorry, Allison, uh, let me jump in here if you don't mind. Um, what the, the original problem uh, or issue, uh, let, let me change that, challenge that we face <laughs> here at the library is, um, <clears throat> is properly prioritizing funding um, uh, MLIA grant funding, and then of course our work that we do, so the funding related to that, um, for um, for improving the cadastral based on whether it's you know whether it's just you know regular maintenance work um, or um, collecting new survey control. Currently, <clears throat> the way we collect survey control is through the grant program. Every once in a while, we'll get a data dump um, from a surveyor that wants to share it with us. We welcome, and I and and Bob, I'll I'll, I'll make a plug for you. We welcome, um, you know, survey control at any point in time, and so we're constantly looking for for new survey control. That doesn't mean we can necessarily incorporate it into the current round of um, adjustments or even the next year's round of adjustments. It really just depends because it is such an involved process. And so one of the things that we we're talking about internally, which is what Michael was bringing up and, and Allison, I, I kind of wonder if, if we don't have similar data sets. And so that would be something we should probably dive into a little more is to, to kind of compare what you have versus what we're getting. Um, because we just we're discovering that you know um, there's a lot of different control being collected out there by different groups, um, and we would like to um, streamline the process for collecting survey control, because we understand the public the public value, we understand the relevance of it. So what we've done with the grant program is really try to make it easier for those folks who are trying to. Um, See, they're seeking out a proposal and funding through the MLA grant program for that survey con control collection. And so, um, and it's gonna be a priority for us. <clears throat> we, just, we just see it being a continual priority moving forward. So what we're, like I said, what we're trying to do is just make the, make the process um, a little easier um, on, on folks, um, whether it's the tribes collecting a grant, we've had plenty of tribal um, MLIA grants for survey control. We've, not, we've recently had the DNRC um, reach out and get uh, a grant for, or was awarded a grant for survey control and of course the counties. And so that's, that's kind of the issue that, that we were faced with is prioritizing those collection areas for, um, so that we can, you know, we do have uh, Dan Staley, he is a council member. He sits on the MLIAC subcommittee. Um, for grants, and so we have to have some way to measure and to award this, to award these grants based on not only like the value of the grant itself. You know, let's say we had 20 proposals, we that were all for the PLSS. We'd have to somehow have some sort of way to um, prioritize those. And so what we've what we've been trying to do is prioritize based on geography, and having an awareness um, of where those where those problem areas are. And, you know, Jeff and I and Michael have met recently and just the process is a lot, it's not as straightforward as, as we originally thought or as I originally thought. And so we've been talking about doing some sort of statewide analysis to understand these, these areas that we can then prioritize for funding. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just gonna say part of, you know, where I'm looking at it is that like, if somebody, if MDT and their surveyors have already, for instance, have already gone out and collected this and the Forest Service tends to put coordinate data on their surveys as well, that like maybe we, sh you know, I, I know people like they go, oh, that area needs a lot of work. But if somebody has already done it and it's in the, you know, and there's a stuff available that maybe we can concentrate those grants on areas where there aren't highways and things like that. Yeah, no, Allison, I think you're spot on. I, and I think we're we're working hard now to, because as Bob mentioned, you know, for a number of years, we didn't uh, or couldn't um, incorporate or find some of this existing survey control. So, you know, we would get a grant and focus on that and, and collect it and, um, 
now yeah. we have, you know, connections and better partnerships with MDT. And early on in the process, we we look and and try to find out what existing survey data there is so that we can either reduce the amount that needs to be collected from a grant or collect the same amount, but not duplicate collection and just, you know, collect a larger area. I think getting maybe to your, to your original point, Allison, um, I think we would welcome working with you outside of a, you know, a larger grant process in these places right. where, you know, clearly adjustment needs to still occur and you're finding that, you know, maybe MDT has since surveyed some stuff and there's better control that can be used. Um, as Aaron mentioned, you know, we're largely grant driven. So that's where we kind of focus and prioritize Jeff's time for adjustment purposes. But um, there's always little openings here and there you know, and if we're just talking about a few sections here or there, and there's there's control available, um, there's often time to kind of squeeze in those little small projects in between the larger stuff and, and get it incorporated. Um, yeah. It's just a matter of us knowing about it you know, knowing that control exists and having someone that we can work with to, to get it done. Um, so, yeah, you know, that's, I guess. Yeah, you know, and hopefully, I ask, hopefully that helps. Yeah, I ask for like every county that I do their cadastral maintenance, parcel maintenance on to send me every single survey that gets filed, whether or not they think they need to do anything with it, just so, because, when I started, they weren't sending me these highway surveys because we don't do anything with them. And so I said, send them to me because they're helpful. Like I can use them for things. And um, so now I kind of, right after they're filed, I get a copy. Whether I look at it or do anything with it right away is another story, but I at least know that it's there. And could, you know, send, you know, let you guys know if you're not hearing from MDT right away or just, whatever, you know, tell you what number, sections, townships, that kind of thing. Yeah, I definitely think that's a workflow that's worth exploring further. One idea that I've had, I, this is Dan, um, listening to the conversation and workflows, and I've had this thought for several years, but just can't quite get my mind around how to put it in action but most counties majority counties have an examining land surveyors that look at plats and COSs before they go on the record and part of the review process can include coordinates um, sometimes it does sometimes it doesn't but if there were a way to get that data uh, up to the state after the the COSs and plats are filed, I think the most efficient way would be through the county examining land surveyor because they're the ones that are looking at every single survey before it goes into the record. Yeah, that would be, that would be great. This is Bob Holiday. I would like to talk to you more about that because I have stashed on the hard drive here hundreds of corner records that are just kind of sitting and my thought is I'll be brief it, it, it's my thought is kind of in depth I would like to see some sort of collaboration amongst clerks and recorders in our office and, and morals perhaps to get a centralized, you know, like get corner records scanned and into a centralized database and work with those counties that are making money off of those records to figure out some sort of subscription service to that sort of information. I think it's valuable and I think it's just sitting, well, I know it's just sitting in folders in counties or it's sitting on hard drives at the state library and it's not being used. I have a ton of it. Anyway, that's my pitch for the day. 
Uh, this yeah. is Mike from uh, Yellowstone County. Sorry, Jeff. Um, Don't go for it. Uh, just uh, for, for one, for Yellowstone County, uh, what Dan was mentioning, we kind of have that process. However, we have like six departments that review these plats as we no longer have a county, county surveyor uh, to get into the details of, you know, all the, um, the coordinates and everything. I mean, I, I, I'm one that reviews the plats, so I kind of look at it, but I'm not, I'm not a surveyor. So I'm not, there's some things that, you know, some surveying mistakes that may be on there that I don't see. Um, and then as what Bob was saying before, for our county, we have corner records and we have them all scanned in um, as a repository and um, they are publicly viewable. Um, Obviously, it just it's all it depends on the surveyor to go out and, you know, make the record, make the corner record if they go out there and do it. Um, I, I'm under the impression that they have the option to do it or not do it. So that, that's just no, my it's, two cents. It's, uh, it's only an option to do it or not do it if it hasn't been done before. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. So if there's no public record. For that corner, it's uh, it's required. Oh, okay. Well, that's good to know. This is Brandy. Will the um, RTN network that's continuing and hopefully expanding that should help with digital data collection, right? Yeah, it definitely will. I'll give an update on that later, along with the grant program. Um, <clears throat> so the RTN, we're in the middle of um, basically um, uh, getting off of a pilot project, but um, it will it will help in that it will reduce uh, the amount of time spent in the field theoretically, and um, <clears throat> I'm hoping it will drive the price down per point. But I th that is my hope. I have not I have not validated that with a surveyor. Um, so, I, you know, Wally or, or Dan, you could probably speak up to that. It, it would also just um, allow for folks to use that, um, that information for uh, post uh, correction. So we'll have that information publicly available eventually. Um, but in the meantime, you know, it'd be a, it, it, it could be something that could improve our, our workflows. I'm kind of, this is Dan, I, I was just going to pipe in if Wally didn't. Wally's kind of the authority on our, the RTN in, in the surveyor circle. So, um, but no, we're, it definitely makes data collection easier uh, being in a zone where the RTN covers. Uh, surveyors are starting to use it more and more, I think. This is Matt with the Montana Ambulance. I've got a question um, regarding non-surveyor collected survey control uh, data. So every year uh, we have projects that come in where we can tell the cadastral is, is not aligned um, properly. So we can go out. Um, we will carefully collect field data, um, lat longs for, and we will find the pins uh, associated with the survey or the legal description. Um, and we'll carefully collect that data. We'll, we'll even post-process it here um, to make it a little more accurate. Is there, a, is there a process for just general submission of that uh, when it, from a non-surveyor's perspective? Matt, Bob Holliday here. Um, if you want to contact me, what, um, I can get that information included. We've got a, uh, yeah, that, that page that Aaron just posted in the chat. It is horribly out of date, but I think my contact information is probably there. We do take we do take crowdsourced data. We clearly mark it as such. Yep. We don't make much of an accuracy assessment on it, but we will use it in adjustments if, if we're in an area that needs to be adjusted that, that that we're working. We haven't like 
has been pointed out, we've so far, we've been pretty much grant driven, but if, if we have data and there, there are small areas that need to be adjusted while we're kind of in between projects, I think that stuff could be worked in. Okay, great, great. Yeah, a good example of that is uh, Ken Miller's work, um, Ravala County. We just re recently incorporated his entire survey network um, that he's collected over over many, many years. Um, so we we did a statewide adjustment on that. And, and this has kind of been on the, on the, on the back load for several years. And we've, it's finally came time to, to move that up, up the priority list. Um, but yeah, Ken's done a great job with, with that. And I believe he's collected the vast majority of that and probably incorporated some of MDTs and some of uh, some local surveyors, um, th their points in with that too. So um, yeah, so I thought I'd highlight that. That's a great example of us uh, taking control. Thank you. Yeah, this, this is all good stuff, everyone. So I, I appreciate everyone chiming in and, and yes and i and i do echo the the, the corner uh recordation and even the the surveys too there there's um there's some counties out there that offer you know like yellowstone county for example and so is flathead county where they offer all this stuff off their their websites and it's very helpful uh especially for me if i'm in a, in that area adjusting um to have it um publicly available um, otherwise i i do knock on uh the, the county's doors um in terms of acquiring some of that data. I did that with Madison County and Allison would remember that uh, Madison County and uh, Park County when we were in those areas last year or so. Yeah. And um, most of us DR analysts have access to our, to the county clerk and recorders websites and all of their documents. So we're able to pull those pretty easily as well. Is so that a subscription? Have, Sorry, yeah. I, I just do want to interrupt there, Allison. Is that a subscription that, that you all subscribe to? Or I guess how many of the counties do you have access to? We subs um, in my region, I know we subscribe to every county that offers an online subscription option. And so um, I know there's counties that don't that you actually have to physically go in. But um, yeah, for, especially now that the DOR doesn't have offices in every county, like being able to go search documents online is a huge help. So I have access for um, all of my counties except Mar. So that would be Beaverhead, Gallatin, Madison, and Park. Um, and some of them I have my own login. Some of them I share a login with other DOR employees so it just and they you know some counties I know don't charge us for the subscription some of them do so it, it really is a 56 county kind of deal but there are you know the DOR especially in my region has made it so that everybody can have access to the stuff that's online if they need it. Yeah I think Allison's uh kind of unique in that um, that she has that kind of access. I think, uh, especially on the east side of the state, um, yeah. there are less counties that have their things digital. And if they do, it's an internal system only where you, you can go look it up on a computer, but you have to be on the computer in their building to look yeah. it up. So that has handicapped us with not having, um, no longer having DOR staff in every county. Yeah. Okay, um, I, I can probably just go just highlight some, you know, of our current methodology um, for identifying these improvement areas. 
Um, one way is uh, if it has a high PLSS point reliability number. Um, currently though, with our adjustment model, um, it is not, um, not changing those, those numbers on the surrounding points for the collected control. Um, so that is one, one major issue that Michael was alluding to. And it, it makes it challenging for us to, you know, to, to identify those, those, uh, those improvement areas if our current adjustments are not reflected in there. Um, I have a ex couple examples. Let me just go to my map here real fast. Um, I think this one's Livingston. Yeah, so Livingston's a good example too. Um, <laughs> you can see you can see these these triangle points are the areas that we have control in, but you can you can visibly see. I mean, I do have some symbology on these reliability points, um, with the red ones obviously being the worst reliability numbers. But that that's just an example that the surrounding points are not currently being adjusted. Uh, we are moving into an ArcGIS Pro parcel fabric um, within the next several months. Um, BLM's contractor Premier um, out of Colorado. Um, they are they will be taking our data here shortly um, and then migrating it into um, ArcGIS Pro parcel fabric. We are currently still in the Arc, um, Arc Map parcel fabric and some of you probably have experience with that horrid uh, software as some of you probably have stories and we certainly have our stories too. So um, so yeah, so that's, that's one, one area. One just recently, um, I don't think we have any Lake County um, representation on here, but they recently applied for a grant. I think it was uh, FY18 or 19. And we did that adjustment last year. Um, so this is this is a good example here. Uh, I think I could turn on the, you can see the improvements that we made to these parcels. Um, so it's a pretty significant shift that, that we did when we incorporated that control and ran the adjustment. Um, the green is obviously the, the current, red is what was the non-adjusted um, in this area. Uh, um, but just zooming back out again, you'll see all the red here. Um, and I know this was some justification that uh, Lake County had used in, the, in their grant as areas um, that they had identified um, that they wanted to collect control in. So it is even a mechanism that, um, that is being used by, by grantees when they submit. And I've talked with staff here is um, it's it's kind of a, a loose a loose end. I think that that probably needs to be tied up. And I will be talking with um, with our uh, our federal partners about this and how how we are able to um, how we are able to um, essentially update these points. Uh, when we do move into the ArcGIS Pro model, the least squared um, engine the least yeah the least squared adjustment engine does update those reliability numbers so it will not be an issue going forward but it has been an issue with our adjustments going back to 2009 and forward so that's that's a lot of catching up to do in my eyes so and then the third example and i think we use this a lot in in our uh um, posters that we have here um, at the state library um is, is fairfield um, turn on Fairfield, come on. Fairfield got a, a significant um, adjustment, um, as, you can, as you can see here. Um, it would probably be, eh, it's not nearly as bad as of the adjust, adjustment that is needed in belt, but it is. So the orange is where where the parcels were hanging out in the middle of the, the streets. Um, and then you can kind of see that the cleaned up version from the control that was collected with uh, Teton County's grant. So um, that's just, those are just three really good examples. Um, and yeah, you can see the, the, point, the red points up here, um, some orange ones down here. So um, and then 
we also have kind of staff identified areas as well. So we take input from, from public uh, DOR analysts um, and, and obviously here, um, those of us GIS analysts at the, at the state um, and most of it's just aerial photography um, inspection. So, and I, I think one thing that we did talk about and I'm sure it's possible, but I think the, the factors on it are, are hard to, to kind of pinpoint or the methodology is doing some sort of a machine learning um, exercise with with this uh, with areas that need to be improvements. Um, that's just one example of what we've been talking about here here locally um, that that we could potentially um, apply uh, to a statewide data set. So. Um, I don't know if anyone has any comments about the current methodology um, and kind of where we're, we're heading on that. Um, we're hoping to make some improvements to that and, or at least identify them within this assessment plan. Um, and, and we would certainly need everyone's help um, with that. So um, I guess look for that in the, in the coming months for sure. You know, Jeff, this is Alan with the BLM. Uh, you're right on with that ARC Pro tool giving us that reliability back. We kind of lost that from years ago. We used to have that at the BLM before I came here. They were able to run those reliability diagrams to give us input on where we had to, you know, the, the most discrepancy in control. And I think we're going to get that back from what we see once we move to that to that Arc Pro fabric, um, I think it's going to give us a lot more uh, ability to to analyze those those areas. But I guess speaking from somebody who's on, you know, the grants subcommittee, is that you know there's plenty of money to go around, and maybe I'm speaking out of turn because I don't hold the money purse on that. But there's plenty of money to go around. If, if you have control issues and you can justify them, even without reliability numbers, and you can justify the need, I would say put in for an application for adjustment. Uh, I, I think it will be seen by the committee and, you know, folks like Dan Staley can, can look at it from a surveyor standpoint and uh, attest the, the need for uh, control. So I, I would say by all means, put in for those grant dollars. Yeah, I guess one of the struggles that, you know, that I see with, with the grant program and I've, and I've mentioned this to Aaron and Michael, but I thought I'd share it with, with you all is, um, is getting these getting these areas adjusted that we have, that we have already identified um, that are the smaller counties that don't have very very many GIS resources. So the Lincoln counties, the um, Muscle Shell, the Wheatland, um, those those sorts of examples where we know there's some huge issues um, within some of those counties, um, and, and so yeah. That's that's kind of my take on that is you know the grant program, though it's nice, um, it is you know kind of some of the, the PLSS um, grant applications that we've seen in the past um, have been from kind of resource driven areas, so the Park counties, the Gallatins, Missoula's, all of those. But it doesn't really, at least from a PLS standpoint, we haven't really seen much from the the rural counties. Minus McCone. McCone's kind of been the, the one, um, you know, Nancy's part time there, but that's one of the almost the lone, ex I wouldn't say lone exception, but one of the um, one of the examples where a rural county is stepping up because they have identified their within their own needs um, areas that that control is needed to be collected. So. Yeah, right, Jeff, this is Alan. It does require a local partner. Um, if the BLM could put in for grant money, I would identify a lot of hot spots <laughs> and I would go out and hire surveyors uh, as fast as I could and, and pick up those areas and get them done. But we can't apply for any of that dollar. So we need 
someone at the local level to be the front person on that. We could certainly help and be part of that, but we can't, uh, we can't be the head yep. and the, the, the main applicant. And I'll kind of um, ditto what Alan just said. You know, I've been involved in control projects way back when, when Alan was with uh, doing them in Gallatin County and then as recent as McCone. And um, it's spot on with the, the, the discussion is um, it's difficult to uh, convince a county that they need, uh, they need a parcel fabric adjustment, they need a CAD and SDI project without a, a really good reason um, for them to apply for that. And so a lot of these counties, there, there are really good reasons, but if you don't have somebody local like Nancy that uh, can communicate those reasons to the commissioners, it's just gonna get overlooked. Uh, hi, this is Aaron uh, from City of Great Falls. That was my issue it was coming up with reasons from a city perspective since we kind of maintain our own parcels and like the PLSS is sort of an aside that we use as reference. Um, I don't know, if, Dan, if you know of some of those reasons that I, I can relate this to the administrators from like the public, um, I would love to hear just to kind of add to my ammunition. I'm, I'm working on it as we speak. <laughs> To, but uh, you, you know the the um, the the main impetus, I guess, from the ones I've seen in the smaller counties and the and the less populated, still centers around towns, and uh, I think Ekalaka would be a good example of this. I don't think I, I think their clerk and recorder told me that. They cannot, when somebody purchases a house in Ekalaka, they cannot get title insurance because the parcel fabric's so messed up there. Um, so that one's kind of an easy, uh, you know, e an easy one to explain. Um, it's the muscle shells that, that I struggle with where, you know, I think that's a, that's a county that's been identified by the state as a priority area. Um, and it's just communicating to the commissioners or the governing body or the clerk and recorder or whoever is going to take ownership of it um, on why it's a priority area and how does that benefit the county. Yeah, I just, it, I want to add to the conversation. The, um, um, we, we, you know, we've had multiple grants throughout the life of the grant program from for to improve the PLSS from from rural counties to to small towns to tribes and now um, with the DNRC um, uh, state agencies and so um, it you do not have to be a county to fill out a grant to collect survey control um, I, I, let's not discount the the need for a updated control in in the populated areas because obviously you know there's houses there if they can't get insurance that's pretty important um, but we've seen you know uh, collection um, across reservations so that's you know multiple counties um, you know we would encourage state agencies uh, to collect control for multiple counties. And so we just need someone <laughs> to take on the grant and take on the project and the responsibility. And we understand that it is, you know, it is a lot of work for a, a local or tribal government that does not have the capacity or does not have the staff, uh, you know, to run a project like this. Cause you know, it's, it, it becomes, um, it becomes quite the, you know, the job to project manage over the year or multiple years that you are collecting. Um, but we try to do outreach. Obviously, the um, the pandemic has kept us inside <laughs> for two years or, or, or kept us from going out and doing any kind of um, outreach at these events. But I hope to um, 
catch back up with the commissioners here in um, in February. And Dan, if you're going to be there, perhaps that's the time as we could maybe tag team and, and approach some of these commissioners and, and have some talking points ready. Because I know you usually attend those meetings. I see you there often. And, you know, the sometimes I kind of feel like it, some of these uh, governing bodies or professional associations, um, there's not always, it's a, it's trying to find the right committee to talk to, to talk GIS because they no longer have, uh, at least at MACO, they no longer have that technical, um, that IT group. And so it's, it's trying to find that right person or that champion. And, and Dan, maybe you and I, and, and, and gosh, Wally, we could work on it for tribes too. And, you know, Alan, I'd welcome your input as well. I mean, my first thought on that would be <clears throat> your, your comment about the state, you know, state agencies qualifying for the, for the grant program. I, I wonder if our focus should just shift to state agencies. <clears throat> that might be. We've been more... trying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm just thinking of, uh, you you thinking back, we're, we're, our company is a subcontractor on MDT. MDT and DNRC, NRCS, um, and NRCS would be federal. But I'm trying to think if the deliverables included uh, for the for those projects included, um, you know, data to the state library. But um, it might anyway. That might be something to think about. Is is just encouraging any state agencies that do have survey or mapping projects that include survey control to ask them to just put it in their in their deliverables. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's something the council should take up as a policy that we can then take to the appropriate state governing body and mm -hmm. and ask that to be yeah. um, something that they maintain. Well, I guess correct me if I'm wrong there, Dan. I, I think I think you'd talk to me about um that your your company um, did some work in like Wheatland County for a, like state a state survey, I think it was with the DNRC. I mean that was that's one thing. Uh, I mean some of these state agencies that do their own surveys, um, we we never hear of that, and obviously we never really receive that controls. But I think that's just one example of something that the workflow could be worked out, and it probably just doesn't stop at you know state agencies either. It probably goes to to the counties too, you know. Um, cause I know some counties have their own, um, their own survey surveyor's office. So. The, with the pause, I'd like to interject here a little bit. This is Wally Gladstone. Mm -hmm. Um, I, the, the kind of the thing not being said here a whole lot is the the GIS and the and land surveyors interworking together and and what data can be shared and what data can't be shared. State rules. We've we've put a lot of, on the tribal side. We put a lot of effort into getting a real time network so so data could be geo referenced quickly and and everybody's working on that same same platform. The other piece we did is we put a lot of effort into creating the local coordinate systems or the LDPs, they call them little distortion projections. Those things, we the, the manual that we had used to be called the Rocky Mountain Tribal Coordinate Reference System. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is getting changed to the Rocky Mountain Coordinate Reference System. Um, we've had a lot of engineering firms and surveying firms contribute to the, to the latest update. Morrison Merrily, Allied Engineering, DJNA, Staley, Alpine Engineering, Interstate Engineering, Sand Survey, and Cushing and Terrell, WGM in the Missoula County chipped in there too. They 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 chipped in just because it's an easier system to use and it's it's faster. The the piece that's a real plus to it is when they go out and collect data, it's now geo-referenced in a in a known coordinate system. We haven't got all of the new coordinate systems into the into Esri, we're, we're still working on getting those those embedded. But with, within the reservations, data is being collected. 
it's being collected in a known coordinate system. Mm -hmm. And with three clicks of a mouse, you can add that into, into Esri. The piece, not, not wanting to step on Marl's toes and, and, and realizing state, state rules don't apply to the reservations, it, what gives us the advantage of being able to cut red tape on it is, is I'd like to be able to, to try to figure out how to do a little pilot project between the, the BIA, the, the BLM's bill of survey over there and, and a little push from the Rocky Mountain tribal leaders to just to collect that data. And you got a whole bunch of information that could be improving the cadastral pretty quick. So it's, here's my food for thought there. Jeff. Yeah, that's that, that's that's great. I, I I think we are welcome to to see what that that project would entail, and and I know we've we've made great strides um, with survey um, control, you know, receiving survey control on those um, reservations, um, and some of the work that uh, Premier has done, um, BLM's contractor, with improvements to those town sites. So um, do appreciate everyone's effort on on those fronts. Um, um let's see so i guess new items for april um what's what's everyone thinking i mean i think we could probably do a deeper dive on on some of the stuff we had covered today maybe some new stuff um welcome to some ideas Yeah, Wally here again. What what I'd like to do, or is is start working. Well, planning on starting to work with the between the BI and the tribes and getting that data submitted in in on flash drives and stuff. But the piece I'd like the this thing I'd like to see from the from the library is if we get that data and are able to start bringing it in, is we'd like to send it to your direction. Not looking for any money from the grants or any of those items. Is just starting to send that information to you guys and you guys being a partner and. And in putting that data into the in the cadastral. But it's gonna take a little bit of a process to figure out how you guys get me that information. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I, I, I in Jeff, this this is Dan. And I, I would just second that as a as a good topic. Um for, for, for the data that's collected that isn't part of a grant project, um, it'd be nice if there was just a desired format um, it, that everybody could follow to submit it. Okay, yeah, yeah thanks, Dan. Um, I know you and I talked about that extensively last week, so. Um, is there anyone else? Um, I know Brandy, you'd mentioned something about standards. Um, are you? Do you want to yes. kind of touch on that? I guess are we are we talking more like the the cadastral data itself, um, like the attribution standards, or um, well, that systems? that too, that too. But um, I mean, coordinate systems, as long as it's easy, as long as you know there's Azure projection files, that's not a huge hurdle. Um, but if like for DOR, we tell all of the analysts to draw it to the PLSS so that if it's adjusted, then it moves. And if when we have areas that don't do that, uh, like I know when um, with, with Aaron, with Great Falls, we've been working a lot um, with them, but his predecessors very nicely um, adjusted their parcels so that they fit better for the city. But um, it wasn't, I guess, I don't know if it wasn't the quality level or whatever, but those adjustments weren't fit to be added into the CAD and SDI. And so then we had like this weird hole and there's all mm -hmm. sorts of gaps and overlaps and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, but cause we, we do, um, um, we make, we do use derived layers from parcels across the state. Um, so for example, like we, uh, have a levy district layer that we have to that we have to maintain for centrally assessed in order to do 
the big business personal property reporting and things which are outside of our domain and what our analysts do. Um, but if we have, we're, if we're constantly having to shift specific counties or something, or we don't have data, enough data to fix those parcels or whatever it may be, um, things just don't work right. So I guess we're kind of dealing with that right now because I know there was a kind of a statewide adjustment just with switching coordinate systems, I guess, but not just from a reprojection. And um, so suddenly I was like, hey, I don't think we did anything to the other five counties. <laughs> So it's just making sure everything fits up. And I would love, I know this is like a pipe dream, but I would love it if uh, we actually had a nice fabric without gaps and overlaps between county boundaries. I know I'm asking for a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, and I, and I know you and I have talked about this too. There's even conflict areas within BLM surveys too. Um, right. Alan, Al, Alan probably knows this too, where there's overlapping and gaps in even township surveys. Right. <laughs> so. yeah. there's, there's errors in legal descriptions for county boundaries as well. So we stumbled on that one. Yeah, there, yeah, there's still some debate over what the park Sweetwater boundary in the Forest Service area. Yeah, yeah. but I know. Um, so I guess some of it's just yeah, if there's statewide standards um, with the with the data itself, what um, what background grade you're using, which hopefully is the PLSS, um, and how you go about doing that, and the attributes as well, because um, we we've started having our analysts put down the the recording date so that we can try to um, filter out more easily this is for this tax year, this is for that tax year. Um, and we just sort of guess with the others and go, okay, well, we think all of this was for this tax year, but we're not really sure. <laughs> um, and then, I mean, we do have a scheduled meeting on the 20th, but um, I'm not sure if the vast majority are planning on attending the big sky geocon in Missoula. If we want to attempt to meet there instead, um, that could be, you know, kind of a a nice a nice um, place to meet. Um, some of us would actually be able to meet in, per in person as well. So, um, not sure if, if that's or if we should just stick with the twentieth and st um, stick with the online. Or curious of your guys' thoughts of of that. This is Dan. I think there are, are going to be a lot of us there um, for, for a conference, but then there's a Miliac meeting too, I think. Isn't there, Aaron? Yeah, that is correct. It's being held on Tuesday before the conference. Um, so during the workshop times. Yeah. yeah. What, the place where I was thinking about doing this, because um, Thursday, we're actually going to pull part of the, the agenda. Probably, I think it's going to be in the afternoon, maybe the the end of the morning or whatnot. But we're going to dedicate those portions to do roundtables, any sort of uh, meetings. Uh, I think the local government SIG was potentially interested in meeting at, um, at one of those times, too. So just different formatted uh, talks um, that that we're able to, to learn and, and share ideas better um, is I think that's kind of where we're, we're going with that. Just, just from listening to some of the, some of the stuff that we're, we're doing within the, the planning committee. So. I think it would be interesting and worthwhile to have a session um, about this group and soliciting feedback or mm -hmm. questions from, you know, the general public. But then I think we should still have, like that wouldn't really be a meeting. It would just be more to broaden some of the uh, participants just to get a almost informal survey of what they think is going on or what they have trouble with or whatever. And then we, then we still meet on the 20th. That's a good idea, Brandy. That way, if the local SIG meeting <laughs> conflicts with this, uh, <laughs> I just kind of feel like sometimes like you, it's hard to, it's hard to, you know, to choose one over the other, especially in, you know, there's such a big overlap, but um, I think that's, I think that's a good idea. It, it, it might be nice just to informally, you know, have folks get together and I don't know, have breakfast or something like that, get a beer together. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think the Elevation Working Group has, has done that in, in the past too. So yeah, I mean, I think in some sort of capacity, we probably, we could meet somewhere in, during the conference time. So um, Aaron, you can have the floor if you want to talk about your grants for a little bit. Sure, thank you. Um, uh, so can I, can you let me share my screen? I think so. Um, <clears throat> So if you just uh, go to my name and in the participant list. Okay, you should be able to share now. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So if someone could just uh, give me a thumbs up or let me know you can see. Yep, you're good. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I uh, hopefully you have all received some sort of notification through um, through groups uh, that you're signed up for with the state library for receiving notifications, or through MAGIP or MLIAC uh, listservs. And I just wanted to um, to remind folks that the um, the MLA grant program is open and taking applications is a very short timeline. Um, basically, the materials uh, are always posted on the fifteenth of January, and the application um, closes on. Um, or excuse me, I think I said the fifteenth. Yeah, no, I said the fifteenth of January. Sorry, um, <clears throat> and then closes on February 15th at five o'clock. Uh, there is a short window uh, for application revision. That's if something uh, in your applications is missing, for example, uh, PLSS applications or the improvements to the CAD and the CI. Um, there are some additional documents that are needed. So if that's missing, you've got about two weeks to get that um, submitted and then the grant subcommittee will review and prioritize um, that funding uh, for the proposals received um, and, uh, and will also um, prioritize those in time for the first council meeting this year, which occurs uh, April, let's take a look real quick. I think it's April 5th, which is a Tuesday um, for for the state fiscal year FY 2023. And so that begins on July 1st of this year and then would run for one uh, full calendar year with deliverables to be received no less than 10 days prior to um, uh, closeout, which would be uh, June 30th of, uh, of 2023. Um, I think Alan kind of hit on this. Um, these are the folks that are eligible for, um, for grants. That would be uh, state agencies, uh, local government agencies, and Indian tribal governments and tribal entities. We, um, we are using an Amplifund tool, uh, which is an online grant management tool that um, you will have to register for. Um, and if you already have um, submitted a grant with, um, with a different program uh, with the state of Montana and they use Amplifund, you can use that same login. Um, and we have a couple trainings coming up um, that I think you'll find interesting and useful. Um, the first training is for uh, using the Amplifund tool. So it's a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a tool that actually needs a training, <laughs> uh, like most tools that we use, and um, uh, that will take place on Tuesday, January 25th. I highly recommend attending that training, um, and it will be recorded if you cannot attend. And then um, the second training, pretty excited about this. We haven't done this in a while. Um, there is going to be a grant proposal writing workshop conducted by Janet Cornish of Community Development Services Montana on Friday, January 28th um, from nine to noon. And so she'll teach uh, the uh, basics of grant proposal writing, writing for clarity, and then we'll go over the basics of the program and the pieces of the application itself. Registration is required. Um, it will all be online. They will both be recorded. Um, 
So we just highly recommend that you attend those. We've seen a very positive um, correlation to uh, folks who've attended that training to um, for successful grant proposals. So again, highly recommend it. We also have uh, on the MLIAC webpage, we have um, the previous recorded workshops linked here. So if you're interested in, in seeing uh, some of those previous workshops, those are, those are also made available online as well. Um, the, uh, so if you're interested in filling out a grant, it's like what it, uh, you wanna know what your steps are. So first of all, um, let me just do this. We highly recommend that you read the land information plan and understand the priorities. Um, and I can send this out to folks afterwards. Um, that is posted um, through the website. I'll drop the link in here as well. Um, and so as long as, long as um, basically you have to identify one grant priority when you are um, uh, creating an application, and, um, and you're gonna have to prove that that uh, proposal aligns with that grant priority in the, in the relevance and public benefit section and also in the scope of work. <clears throat> and so it's important to read that land information plan. And then we recommend that you download and read the MLA grant program and application guidelines and other supplementary materials. So if you are interested in creating a proposal or submitting a proposal for PLSS um, data collection, uh, there are additional materials uh, that you'll have to download. And then we've also created some templates this year um, for um, the scope of work and then also the budget. Um, and then we recommend that you familiarize yourself with the Amplifund grant tool. Um, like I said, there's a training, there's documentation, and you can listen to past uh, recorded trainings. Uh, and then, of course, um, attend that free grant writing workshop um, that will be taking place on January 28th. I also recommend reviewing previously awarded MLA grant applications. Um, we have them posted uh, through this through the uh, MLA grants page, and you can take a look to see uh, some other projects that have been successful in the past. And then also, this is really important um, that you collaborate with your respective MSDI theme leads, data partners, and potential funding partners. Typically, at this point in the in you know. In submitting a proposal, you hopefully have already done that by now, um, but don't forget to uh, make sure you're working with them to, um, <clears throat> to, to align that proposal to the best and greatest uh, best practices or standards that we have available and just to get their input. And then uh, uh, please feel free to reach out to us with any of your uh, grant related questions. So that is one thing I wanted to bring up with everyone. And then also um, we are in the process of transferring, let me pull my, uh, I apologize, I'm trying to pull up the document I just had open. Um, we are in the process of um, transferring uh, a, a pilot project, um, oh, where is it, from, that we had uh, have had hosted um, for the with the state of Washington. So the state of Montana and some tribal partners reached out to the state of Washington to host a uh, pilot project for real time network, and um, <clears throat> and they've been doing so for the past uh, I think it's almost three years now, and um, we had received funding uh, this past legislative session to. Um, uh, to bring that to the State Library. We're partnering with the Department of Transportation. Um, we're working on um, getting off that uh, the, the Washington State servers and we have the, uh, the next goal date of the end of this month of being off of their network and having one stood up. Um, it will eventually be a paid, um, uh, a paid service um, for, um, a service, uh, a subscription service. Uh, we, we don't have that model set up yet. We're working on that. I do believe Evan Hammer is on the line. If you wanted to go into any more, please feel free. But we have, um, we're going to work with uh, partners and the, uh, the Department of Transportation to, to build out uh, the network so that we have full state coverage 
and I would say that, um, and we also hired um, uh, a a new network operator, an RTN coordinator, um, and I am going to butcher his last name. Hold on just one second. His name is Kazi Ari Fuzeman, um, and he has joined us uh, this, I think, early, I can't remember which date you started in. I think it was in December, um, but uh, we're really excited to have him on board, and he's tasked with uh, with with helping stand up this network. It's going to be a great service for the rest of the the state of Montana, and um, and we look forward to informing the GIS and uh, survey communities as the information uh, becomes available. Evan, I didn't know if you wanted to say anything as well. I don't. I don't really think I have much to add. Um... Thanks, Aaron. The uh, basically we will be moving uh, at the end of this month when we move off the Washington network. Uh, we'll be moving into what we're going to call an extended pilot uh, through the end of the year. So it'll be remain at no cost through the extended pilot period. But then uh, the subscription service we expect to have all the pieces in place by the end of the year uh, to go live uh, January one of twenty three. And that's where things are. Thanks. Thanks, Evan. Jeff, I think uh, if, if anyone has questions um, about the grant program, we can we can address those now, um, and we can do our best to answer any RTN related questions too. And I see that we are over by 13 minutes. <laughs> Aaron, I just have one question. Sure. Um, I was wondering, uh, we've submitted a, a, a grant uh, through the, the application that I wrote out. Um, some of the timelines need to be changed. Is that, uh, I'm assuming, can that be adjusted before we get our final signature or, or sign off with our administrators? Um, for your yeah. current for your current grant? Yeah, yeah. No, Sorry, you're, it's you're a little aside. <laughs> no, your grant you're, you have an off cycle grant. You, we don't need to adjust the timeline. We're good. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Just yeah, kind yeah. of takes it as it is. Yep, it's just the because it's off cycle, it's just a little different from the other uh, on cycle grants, I guess you could say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no Thank worries. You. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think that pretty much wraps everything up. Uh, sorry, we, we went over everybody. So, uh, you yeah, know, we'll reconvene in um, April. So thanks, everyone. Thanks for participation. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, thanks, Jeff. Jeff. thanks, Jeff. thanks Aaron. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> See you, Jeff. <laughs> you too.